God's got something for us today, and I want to just uh, encourage you in the Lord today. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> I want to talk to you this morning about three attacks to stop your assignment in the earth. The enemy's after you. Do you know that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that your word is alive today. It's moving, it's powerful, it's breathing, it's active in our life. And Father, we thank You today that You are causing Your Word to work Your will and Your purpose within us. So Lord, today we just open our hearts to You and we receive what You want to pour into us today. Lord, again, we don't need to hear from men, we need to hear from heaven. And we ask today that You would just pour into us Your heart, Father, and let us see us as You see us. And as we see You as You are, in Jesus' mighty name. Give the Lord an amen. <clears throat> when I was uh, praying over this morning, the Lord really began to uh, stir my heart to bring some keys, some kingdom keys, into your life to help you not just resist the devil, but to overcome the devil. Amen. The Scripture says, if you resist him, he will flee from you. Uh, sometimes we may feel like we're doing more resisting than we are advancing. But resisting is advancing. Can you say amen? Not only are we going to resist the enemy, but we're going to overcome the enemy. Tom gave us a scripture this morning out of Revelation that says that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of what? Our testimony. Everybody say my testimony. It's very important that you have your testimony. And your testimony is not about where you've been, how bad you've been, how wicked you may have been, or maybe how good you've been. Your testimony is found in Jesus Christ. Amen? Your testimony is not about how much you used to drink or steal or how much, you know, drugs you, you might have done. That's the old man. He is dead in Christ Jesus, and we're not going to talk about him very much. Amen? Your testimony today is in Christ. That's where you live. That's where you operate. That's where life is found. The Scripture says that we find our answers or the yes to His promises in Christ Jesus. Amen? So your testimony is about who He says you are. Think about it. What does He say about you? He says you're more than a conqueror through Him that loves you and gave Himself for you. Amen? You're more than a conqueror. I love that, that Scripture. That Scripture lets me know there that there's more to it than the fight. There's actually a spoil to be gotten. Come on. See, you're not fighting for survival. You're fighting for territory. Amen. The enemy wants you to think you're fighting just to survive. You're fighting to make it through the day. You're fighting just to try to overcome a sin or to overcome a problem or to overcome a tragedy. But I want you to know those should not be your focuses because Jesus already overcame those things. You're fighting for victory and a spoil at the end of the fight. Amen. So many of us say, I just want to make it through. That's good enough. No, you need to take territory with every battle that you fight. Why? Because the enemy's focus in your life to bring tragedy, to bring trial or tribulation, to bring defeat in your life is so focused. He's not just throwing things at you trying to make it stick. He fears you. He fears your call. He feel, fears your purpose. He fears the anointing of God into your life. So He is targeting you at the very things that God has put in you to cause Him to lose His kingdom. And when you're fighting, choose your battles. Don't fight battles that don't have any spoil. Think about that this morning. And don't fight battles that have nothing to do with your purpose and your destiny. The enemy wants to sidetrack you or distract you or bring things into your life that are going to keep you out of your purpose and focusing on your destiny. And when these things rise up, we say, well, well this thing's in my life. I've got to deal with it. 
My question is, why? Why do you have to deal with it? Why do you have to engage every little thing that creeps up in your life? Why do you have to address everything that pops up to try to distract you? Leave it alone. Don't talk to it. Don't acknowledge it. Keep walking. Amen. Because if the enemy can distract you with battles that have nothing to do with your purpose, he will keep you from fighting for your purpose. Do you hear me this morning? So when, you're, when things confront you and things get in your face and things come and they want to uh, engage you in a battle, stop before you react in the flesh. Amen. I know y'all don't do that. Praise the Lord. That's only Americans. Amen. And Filipinos sometimes. Not Filipinos even. But before you react, ask yourself the question, is this fight that I'm being picked to fight have anything to do with my purpose? And if it doesn't, walk away. Leave it alone. Don't acknowledge it. Why? Because the enemy, he'll say, oh, that one didn't work. And he'll find something else, and he'll find something else. And then he'll get to the point that he will have to attack you in your assignment, and that's the fight that you want. Why? Because he is holding some things that belong to your purpose. And when he engages you with those things, you can say, now, this is the fight I was built to fight. This is the fight I was born to fight. You see, you're born to fight certain fights, and you're, you are not to get in the ring with fights that you were not born to fight. Does this make sense? Sometimes some of us, our life can be full of aggravation and stress and battles that have nothing to do with our purpose. And in fighting those fights, we wear ourselves out and we wonder, God, do you really have a purpose? Yes, I do, but you're fighting the wrong fights. Does this make sense today? You see, you can't take a, a, a featherweight fighter who trains hard and he's a champion as a featherweight and put him in the ring with a heavyweight. It just won't work out. Why? It doesn't matter how many belts he holds in his, in his weight division. He's fighting against something that's bigger than him, that's stronger than him, that's faster than him, that he was not built to fight. There are things that we're getting in the ring with in our life that we were not built to fight. And therefore, that means God has built somebody else to fight that fight, you fight what you're built to fight. Does this make sense today? Jesus had all kinds of battles coming at him. He had all kinds of things that were being thrown at him that were not his fight. Let me give you an example. There was these religious men, these Pharisees, and they had caught this woman in adultery. I've always wondered how they caught her. Were they regulars? Mm. You know, you always wonder that, right? You, that's a question we don't want to, we may not ask. I ask those questions. You know, well, maybe they, they had set her up, whatever it was, they brought her to Jesus, and Jesus was, was writing in the dirt. And we don't really know what he, what he was writing, but he was writing in the dirt. And they asked him about the woman, and they said, the law says to stone her. And this was not a fight that Jesus was engaged in for His purpose. But it was for her purpose, right? And, and He said to them, well, uh, you boys, the one, ones of you that don't have any sin in your life, go ahead and, and throw the first stone. And they started dropping their stone. And Jesus is still drawing in the sand. And, 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 the, and Jesus says, where's your accuser? She says, I have none. He says, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. This was not some great theological philosophical destiny battle that Jesus was engaging in that had to do with His purpose. You may have to speak into other people's purpose at times, but it didn't require a fight. Think about that. Jesus didn't fight. He just spoke. He brought present truth into their messed up reality. Fight your fights. Jesus, look, let's go into Luke 1. I just Luke 4, verse 1. <clears throat> this says here, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. 
and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said unto him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, we tend to focus on the latter part of that Scripture. But let's look at the first part. It says that Jesus was full of Holy Spirit. Everybody say full. That doesn't mean half full, three quarters full, seven eighths full. He was full, right? And this is a key to Jesus' his, his situation mentally, spiritually, physically, as He was getting ready to enter into a fight that had to do with His purpose and His destiny. Now, Jesus was full. It's important that you and I remain full of Holy Spirit. This is not a walk that you can take or fight that you can engage by just being somebody that reads your Bible. Amen. You need to be people that pray in the Spirit. I want to encourage you, pray in tongues every day. People say, that's not popular anymore. And how are their fights going? What do their families look like? What do their finances look like? What do their relationships with others look like? We need to be people that pray in the Spirit. Why? Because the Scripture tells us that Holy Spirit knows how to pray even when we don't know how to pray. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. And He groans through us with words or sounds or groanings that cannot be uttered by man. Are you with me this morning? You must be full of the Spirit, and the way you get full of Holy Spirit and remain full of Holy Spirit is you spend time with Holy Spirit. Spend time in the presence of God. Spend time praying in the Spirit, receiving and worshiping and allowing God to pour back into your life. Because when you come out of the presence of God, you're coming out of the locker room, hallelujah, ready to enter the ring for the fight of your life. Ah, glory to God. Return, Jesus returned from Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now here's another key for us, is that as we are headed into wildernesses, you must be led into the wilderness. Let me say it this way, as you're being led into the fight, you must be led by the Spirit into the fight. Amen? You can't just say, well, I'm going on a fast. I'm going to go into the wilderness. I'm going to seek God. You'll get your tail kicked if you're not led by Holy Spirit. Amen. you got to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, it says here, 40 days, he was being tempted of the devil, and he ate nothing. Here's another key that I grabbed for that. It's not a point we're going to dwell on. But when you're in these fights, there is always a time limit on the fight. There's a season for the fight. Some of you have been fighting battles for 20 years, 40 years, 50 years. My question is, are you in the right ring? Are you fighting the right fight? Well, it felt like the right fight. Was it something that just agitated you? Or was it something that offended you? See, every time the enemy came to Jesus, whether it was through a religious leader or through someone demon-possessed, he wanted to offend Jesus, get him off his game. And we cannot live offended. Amen? Are you with me this morning? Don't live offended. If people have offended you, here's what the Scripture says do. Forgive. Let them go. Bless them. Pray for them. Send prayers up to heaven for them. Bless them. Send them an offering. Send them a gift card and say, I want to buy you dinner tonight. Don't make arrangements with the cook either. Amen. <laughs> it's, there's always a time and a season to battles. And if you've been fighting fights for many, many, many years, could it be that we're in the wrong ring? Or could it be we don't have the right strategy? It goes on to say here that those days they ended, he became hungry. And the, the devil said unto him, look what he said, it's very important what he said, if you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered and said unto him, 
It is, not, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So when you know that you're in the fight of your life and a fight for your purpose, the first thing the enemy is going to come and do is try to attack your identity. He wants to attack your identity. Not who men have said you are, but who God says you are. Does this make sense today? Because if you don't know who you are, then you'll not become who God's created you to be. And, and, and you becoming that is not sovereign. It's not something you're going to wake up one morning and say, Oh, I got my anointing today. I'm stepping into this thing today. Praise God, God did it. No, there are fights to get where you are. I have people come up to me and they will tell me, they say, Hey, Greg, would you lay hands on me and pray for me? I want what you got. I'm thinking, ah, you don't know what you're asking for. They see, the, they see the miracles. They see the prophetic. They see the Word being preached. But what they don't see is the 35 years of walking and fighting and living and overcoming that we've had to do to get where we are today. And so I've asked them at times, uh, do you want my trials? Do you want my struggles? Do you want my defeats as well as what you see us operating in here? Because what we're doing here is about 2% of the walk. Does that make sense today? So you're going through things, but the enemy is after your identity. Who are you? That's a very important question you need to ask. You need to ask that question regularly. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Well, first of all, you're a son of God. He, he attacked Jesus and he said to him, If you are the son of God, if you are who you say you are, if you are what the rumors are about you in the realm of the Spirit, then do this. Prove to me that you are who you are. Let me just give you some encouragement today. You don't have to prove nothing to the devil. You don't have to prove anything to the enemy. You don't have to prove anything to the people that don't like you. Amen. You don't have to say, well, I'll show them. Mistake number one, I'll. <laughs> right? I'll show them who I am. Bless God. They're not getting this over on me. I know who I am in God. Jesus kept quiet most of the time or He gave one-liners. So the enemy wants to attack your identity. Let me give you this morning the definition of what identity is. Identity is the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. It's the right relation that is established between individual and creator. Wow! Isn't that amazing? It is your character. It is a distinguishing character. So the characteristics that God has placed in you for your destiny and for your purpose is like no other. You're not created like anybody else in this room. You don't have the assignment that anyone else has in this room. The enemy wants to come and attack your identity in God, and he wants to begin to tell you you're not a son of God. When Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 says, yes, those led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. You're sons of God. Do you believe that today? You're sons of God. You're not church members. You're not sinners trying to make it to heaven the best way you can. You are sons of the Most High. Ladies, that includes you too. You're sons as well. Amen. You are sons and daughters of God. You belong to Him. He's your Father. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 says that we can cry, Abba, Father. There's that, that identity that we have within us that connects us to the Father. You're not left alone. Our God is not an absentee dad. He's not a bad dad. He's a good, good father. Hallelujah. And the enemy wants to combat that with you. He wants to attack that with you. He wants you to think that God loves somebody else more than He loves you. You know what? I'm the favorite of God. I'm His favorite. Here's the good news. You are too. You are the favorite of God. You are the apple of God's eye. You are the one that He sent Jesus to die for and to raise from the dead again and to send into heaven again. You are God's precious favorite apple of His eye. Don't let the enemy shake you in your identity. See, the Bible says, I know that I can do all things through Christ 
who gives me strength. I'm able to live that, to be that person that God's called me to be. Galatians chapter 4 says, you're an heir. That means you have an inheritance. That God has something He wants to get into your hand. Something for your assignment that you He wants to get to you. You have purpose. Slaves and servants don't have inheritance. Sons have inheritance. Isn't that good? And you have an inheritance. Don't let the enemy attack your identity. He said, if you are the Son of God, then turn these stones into bread. What was he doing? He was trying to appeal to his flesh. Have you ever had the enemy try to appeal to your flesh? I know you haven't, praise God. I have. We all have, right? He said, look, you're the Son of God. If you'll say it, it'll happen. You can meet your fleshly need by using your identity, your anointing that the Father has given you. And Jesus said, nope, I'll not do it. Even though I'm hungry for something, I don't need to feed myself. That's powerful. See, sometimes when the enemy attacks your identity, you need to go out and prove that you really are who, who you say you are. But you don't have to do that. Jesus had no desire to prove who He was. He said, it is written. See, that's good. See, Jesus was not quoting Bible verses. He was quoting a legal contract from the King of Heaven, His Word and His declaration that set things in motion. He said, it has been declared from heaven. It is, reading, uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Wow! Look at verse 5. He led him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, I will give you, look at this very closely, I will give you all this dominion and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship me, it shall be yours. And Jesus said to him, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. These three major attacks in your life. First, he's attacking your identity. Second, he's attacking your purpose. The enemy wants your purpose. He wants you to sin, which the word sin really and literally means miss the mark. He wants you to miss the mark that God put you in the earth for. Look at this, these few verses of six to eight, five to eight. It says he led him up and he showed him all what? The kingdoms. Everybody say kingdoms. Jesus' purpose was to come and get the kingdom back. Nothing else. Luke chapter 4, it says, Jesus said, I must go and preach the kingdom of God to other cities, for that is my purpose. Are you with me? Jesus' purpose was to preach the kingdom of God. What is Satan offering him here? The kingdom. Satan had it. It belonged to Satan. He had taken it from Adam. He had taken it in a, in a negotiation with Adam, which Adam did not have the right to negotiate it away. But he negotiated the kingdom away. Why? Because when Adam sinned, he didn't lose a, king, a, a religion. He lost a kingdom. Jesus did not come to restore religion. He came to restore kingdom. He didn't come to make you a religious person. He came to restore your kingdom citizenship. That's really, really different. Religion has bound us and told us, this is what Jesus wants from you. But it still leaves you empty. It leaves you looking and longing. It leaves you in a place to where you're not hitting your mark. Jesus came for kingdom. The Scripture says He came to take back what the first Adam gave away, right? And in this Scripture, he's, the enemy is bringing before Jesus His purpose. It's kind of like a fighter going into the ring, and, and the other guy in the other corner has the championship belt. Fighters enter the ring to get the belt, right? They don't enter the ring just to dance around with some other sweaty fella. That's not why you get in the ring. You get in the ring for a prize. And it's like the other guy in the other corner holding the belt, and he comes to you and he says, Look, if you will just acknowledge, 
that I'm the greatest in the world and that I am actually better than you, I'll let you wear my belt. That's what was happening right here. He said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you what's mine because it was given to me. He wanted to forfeit Jesus' purpose by trying to offer Jesus something that he was going to get in winning the fight. Don't take things illegitimately. Don't try to get things in your life that you know God has for you through your flesh or through illegitimate ways. Get it in the ring the right way. Can you say amen? He said here, I'll give you all the kingdoms and its glory, its influence, its weight. I'll make you the king of the earth. How I many know Jesus wasn't interested in being the king of the earth? He was interested in you and I becoming the kings of the earth. Whew, glory to God. Isn't that good? <clears throat> he was interested in you and I becoming the kings of the earth. He came to restore that. It says in the scripture here, oh, he says, the devil said unto him, I will give you all this dominion and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Satan was saying, it's mine, and nobody's getting it unless they get it from me. Now, you got to understand, too, the goal of the enemy, the devil. If you re remember reading in Ezekiel, the enemy said, <clears throat> he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above God's throne. His whole purpose in everything that he did, from the negotiations with Adam in the garden, to when Jesus and he were on this high place, his whole purpose was to get his throne above God's throne, right? So in this process, he said what? To the, to the Savior of the world, to the Son of God, to the only begotten of God, Jesus Christ, the second part of the Trinity. He said to him, If you worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms. He was saying, If you'll help me achieve my goal, I'll help you achieve yours. Because if God, Jesus, I mean, oh, Jesus was 100% God, right? He was 100% God. He was 100% man. Everything He did in the earth, He did as man, not as God. So Jesus defeated the enemy in this particular place, not as God, but as man. And He didn't bite the bait that the enemy said, if you'll help me, I'll help you. How many know the enemy will do that in your life? He said, look, 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 look. God, God knows what you really need. Let me help you out. If you'll just do this, I'll make sure this gets you in your life. And then we start to reason, think, well, you know, it may not be so bad. You know, at least, you know, I'll get that in my life, and God can do that in my life after I get it in my life. He can bless my mess. He'll forgive me, and it's easier sometimes to get forgiveness than it is permission. So maybe I'll just do this. Y'all never done that before. Amen. Don't, I saw an elbow. Praise God. We can't do that, right? We have to get it legitimately. And we're not helping the enemy achieve his goals. We're here to expand the kingdom of our Father and help him achieve his goals. Amen? That's why we're here. And, and he said, if you'll do this, I'll give it to you because it's been given to me and I can do whatever I want to do with it. And Jesus told him here, what did he say? He said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus said, Satan, I've known your tricks for all these years from when we created you. And you're not exalting your throne above the Father's throne. I'm going to get it in the fight. It's like looking at that guy said, I'll let you wear my belt. He said, no, no, let the man in the middle hold the belt. We're going to get in the ring. Let the, be let the bell ring. Let the referee do his thing. We're going to fight and I'm going to defeat you. And that's what you do. You face the enemy and say, you'll not have my purpose. You'll not offer me an alternative purpose. You'll not give me something else because you have no right to give it to me anyway. Even though it may be in your hand, I'm coming to take it. Hallelujah! We need to be in that place in our life where we're going to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. 
The scripture says that we have the power to do that. He said, I will anoint you and you will have power, exousia, authority over the powers of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. You are the biggest threat to the kingdom of darkness that God ever created. It's you. Look at somebody say, it's you. Come on, say somebody else, it's you. You are a threat. How do you do it? You pick your fights. You fight for what's causing your destiny to be held hostage. Now let's read on real quickly. He says, and he led him to Jerusalem, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Very peculiar place. And he said unto him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. If you look, every one of these things, if you are, if you are, if you are, if you are. He said unto, excuse me, he said unto them, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Now here the enemy, he'll try to use the word against you. He, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hand, he will bear you up so that you will not strike your fo foot against a stone. He's quoting Psalms 91, where Moses wrote Psalms 91. Satan pulled that and tried to put it to Jesus. The enemy will try to use the Word against you. That's why you must know the Word of God. In this particular passage, Jesus said in verse 12, He said unto him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord God to the test. Then when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. So what was he doing in number three here? He was attacking his relationship with the Father. If the enemy can get your identity, if he can attack your purpose, then he'll attack your, your relationship with God. you got to understand, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 that our first priority is to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. Very powerful thing. Very powerful word. And to understand righteousness, it simply means right relationship. It's, it's a gift. Right standing. Right relationship with God. Why does He want to attack the righteousness or the relationship you have with God? Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, For those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign, R-E-I-G-N, will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He knows if He can take your righteousness and make you doubt your relationship, you'll throw down your crown. You need to pick your crown back up. Straighten it out up on your head. Just shake that junk off out of your life and begin to march and live and walk in life as the king that you are. The enemy wants your crown. Your crown has been given to you through relationship with the Father. You did nothing for that relationship. Jesus did it all. Jesus died for you. He rose again for you. He ascended into heaven for you. He sat down at the right hand of the Father for you. And He decreed from that place that you are seated with Him in heavenly places right now. Not in the future, right now. That you're more than a conqueror right now. Amen? That you have power over the enemy right now. That you are sons in the earth right now. That you've been given a dominion, a sphere of influence and authority right now. Not in the future, now. Somebody say now. It's important to know it's now, right? <clears throat> We've got to live in that. And he said, look, if you throw yourself off, your father will catch you because his word says this. How many times have you got in trouble for wrongly hearing a word and running after something before its season and before its time, and then you say, oh God, would you bless this? No hands are going up. Don't put them up. Amen. Don't put them up. We do that, right? Sometimes we've done that. The enemy tries to trick us 
with the Word, whether it's the prophetic Word that He gives you or a word in Scripture that you read and that Word jumps in you. Yes, that's part of my assignment. That's part of what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, okay, God said this. Let me, oh, I can do it. God said I had a, I had a floating ministry, a walking on the air ministry, so let me throw myself off of this mountain. And then another law kicks in called gravity. And you, you hit that hard bottom, you say, God, you failed me. What happened, God? We were in this together. My part was to step. Your part was to catch. I did my part. You didn't do your part. And then you get bitter at God. You get angry at God because you had a word that was a word from God, but you took that word in the wrong season and out of its context, and you wound up in a mess. you got to be careful. Why? It comes through relationship, through righteousness. You know the voice of God. You recognize the voice of God. You can hear the voice of God. You can move in what God says that you can move in. And you get that through spending time with the Father, spending time in His presence. When the enemy comes this way, you will not be tricked. You'll not be in a place to where you'll be defeated and He won't attack your relationship. See, relationships are strong. None of you are called to walk by yourself. None of us are. You need people in your life. As bad as you hate to hear that, you need people in your life. Amen. You say, I love God, but I don't like His folks. Amen. I heard a guy say one time, I would really enjoy pastoring if I didn't have to put up with people. None of you guys ever said that that were pastors before, right? No, why? Because then God would empty your church. <laughs> They'd all leave, and there you go. Who are you pastoring? Yourself. You're not a leader. You're just on a walk. Hallelujah. you got to understand relationships important. He said one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand. Important relationships. Amen? He sent the apostolic. He sent the apostles out two by two. He didn't send them out one by one. He sent them out two by two. Relationships are so important. Not with just us, but with the Father as well. We need to work on that, build on that, so when the enemy comes, even with a word, you won't be moved to put God to the test. God said, I was going to have, bless God, a brand new Cadillac. Y'all don't have Cadillacs here, do we? No, Mercedes. We got a Mercedes. You got Cadillacs? I haven't seen but one, and it didn't look too well. But, you know, God said, I'm going to have a Mercedes or whatever it is, and you run down to the Mercedes dealership and you lay your hands on the one you like. In the name of Jesus, you belong to me. And then you go in and talk to the salesman. And the salesman says, yes, I believe you're hearing God. Because he needs a commission. And he gets all the paperwork done, your, your credit goes through, you sign it, you drive it off, thank you, Jesus. You show up to church on Sunday. Look what God did for me. And then about the fifth month, uh, oh, pray for me, I can't make my payments. Oh, help God, what are we doing, God? You said this was for me. Y'all get the point. we got to be careful. Yeah, God may, may want you to have it, but is it the right season? Is it the right time? Did it come the right way? That means, you know what, we have to pay attention. We have to have discernment in our life. As Christians, we're not just wandering through life with our head hung up in the clouds. We have to be intentional on everything that we do in life so that we can see the purpose and the destiny that God has for us fulfilled. Does this make sense today? The enemy's after you. You're frustrated. You're in a place that you're like, I'm ready to quit, I'm ready to give up, I'm ready to lay it all down, I'm ready to walk away, I'm ready to kill somebody, bless God. Could it be that you're in this place of wilderness that God wants to bring you back into a place of relationship, walking with Him like you never have before? See, this thing was not meant to be hard. It was meant to be consistent. And you say, but well, I've done these things that are wrong. I've done things that are bad. I've missed it. You know, let me give you a little bit of encouragement today. God does not judge you by necessarily what you have done. He judges you by the motive of your heart. That means you can do good things for the wrong motive and it not be right. Come on, don't shout too loud on a Sunday morning. Help me out, Freddie. We have to be in a place in our life to where we're not yielding to the enemy. 
I really sensed in my heart today that there are many of us in here today that we're in some fights, number one, that we don't belong in. And we've got to lay them down. We're not called to fix it all. We're called to fight what's our fight. Are you with me? I believe that some of us in here today <clears throat> that we are in the fight of our life. You're fighting for your purpose. You're fighting for your destiny. And you feel like you're losing. Today, God's going to give you some strength. We're going to begin to pray for you today. We're going to begin to do what the Word says, lay hands on you today, and begin to believe God for the opening up of a new strength for you. Write this Scripture down. You are more than a conqueror. Through Him that first loved you, and then gave Himself for you. Jesus has paid it all. He's fulfilled it all. He summed it all up. He's won the victory, and He's made you more than a conqueror. Think about it. What ring are you in today? What fight are you in today? My wife and I, we love boxing, not each other. But we bought a TV, Brother Cyril, just so she could watch boxing. Filipinos are violent people. No, I'm kidding. They're not. They're not. They're not. How many of you ever watched boxing before? few of you, yeah? There's this boxer, his name is Manny Pacquiao. Y'all heard of Manny? Incredible man. Friend of my wife, friend of her, her sister's helps in his, her medical mission and stuff that they do. Manny has done something no other boxers have ever done. He has eight belts in eight different weight classes. It's amazing. Manny, when he gets ready to fight, he goes into the ring he didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to fight. He doesn't do that. He spends months training, running, shadow boxing, sparring with an opponent, exercising, eating right, changing his diet. He does so many things. He gets bruised. He gets beat up. He, you know, in the midst of the training, he gets beat up before the fight. And he fights and he trains and he sweats and he fights and he trains and he sweats and he fights and he trains and he sweats. Then he gets in the ring and he fights and he, most of the time he wins. And when Manny wins a fight, he gets the belt. But not only that, he gets this awesome thing called a check. Right? And he makes tens of millions, sometimes over a hundred million dollars he'll make in a single fight. That's a lot of money. Do you agree that's a lot of money? That's a lot of money. And Manny, all that he did paid off for him to get that fight, win that fight, get that belt, and to get that check. But there's another aspect to the fight. Manny has a wife. Her name is Jinky. Jinky. Little old Spitfire Filipina. And when Manny comes out of the ring, Jinky's like this. And Manny has to put the check in Jinky's hand. He does. Jinky never ran, never changed her diet. She never shadow boxed or sparred. She never got bruised in the fight. But she got the benefits of the fight. Manny was the conqueror, but she was more than a conqueror. Right? She more than conquered. How did she more than conquer? She was married to the conqueror. And what he won was hers. Jesus is our conqueror. He won the fight and he came out of the ring ready to give you gifts. Ready to give you the benefit and all of the proceeds of the victory. Everything that Jesus won belongs to you. Don't give it up in an illegitimate fight. Don't allow the enemy to trick you into a fight that he tries to steal your identity. He tries to steal your purpose. He tries to steal your relationship with the Father. Those are three most important things that you're going to need to run and not grow weary, to walk and not faint and to fulfill the reigning assignment that God has on your life as sons and daughters. This morning, God's going to bring a great refreshing in your life. The Word that has been preached to you today, you're going to leave this place 
enabled, empowered to live it and distribute it. See, one of the things that, that Manny and his wife have done with their money is they built thousands of houses for the homeless. They realized that what they won, and it was a they, they won it. There was a conqueror and a more than. That money they won was not just for themselves, it was for others. Your assignment is not for you at all. It's for others that God brings into your life. And others need you to be on top of your game. Are you with me? It's not about you. You're a dead man. It's not you living. It's Christ living in you. So when the dead man tries to get up and tries to make his presence known and his wishes known, just put another nail in the coffin. Don't be offended. Don't let the enemy trick you. Don't let the enemy pull you into things that are not yours to fight. Don't do it. Stand with me. Jesus. I believe today that this day is a pivot point for you and this ministry. See, when you grab a hold of these three things, there's no stopping you. You automatically begin out of who you've been created to be to take territory for God. Father, my prayer today is over every person under the sound of my voice that, Father, where we have surrendered identity and purpose and relationship with you, Father, we would begin to allow you to wash us to cleanse us this morning, to refill us with Holy Spirit. Father, in a way that, that, dear God, we see complete restoration of these things in our heart today. In our heart today, God, in our mind today, in every fiber of our being will sing the song of identity, purpose, and relationship. That, Father, our eyes would be fixed upon you. We'll not move to the left, to the right. We'll not be swayed by in, by, by the antagonization and the words of the enemy. But Father, today, we will only be led by your Spirit and your Word. For your Word is life. Your Word is Spirit in us today. And Father, you have an assignment for us to do. You have an assignment for this body. You have an assignment, Father, for this, for this, for this people today. And it is to bring awakening to this nation, Father. And Lord, we remove our eyes from ourselves today. And we repent today, God, of looking to us for all things, for, for even offenses. And today we fix our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. And we say, Father, this morning fill us afresh and fill us anew with your Holy Spirit that we would be able to resist the enemy in great ways and live in the victory of our risen Christ. Hallelujah! I decree today over your people that we will not live in struggle and defeat, but we live from the victory of our risen Christ. We will not live in Jesus' name from struggle, from defeat, but we are living from the victory of our risen Christ. I just release that into your life and into your heart today. Come on, just begin to pray. Just begin to pray. He's settling. I see the cloud of the Lord settling in this place over you today. Father is here to refill you. Some of you are going to regain your purpose. Some of you have walked away from your purpose and you're just doing something, abiding time. But God said, I'm going to shift that for you this morning and I'm bringing you back into your purpose. I'm bringing you back into your identity. I'm fixing that place where you went off track and you said, I won't do this any longer, but I'll just do this to survive. God is bringing you out of survival and He's bringing you into a place of beginning to run again taking over the camp of the enemy. If you're here this morning, you say, Greg, I need that prayer. I need, I want my identity restored. I need my purpose restored. I need my relationship with God restored. I'm going to invite you to come up here in just a moment to do that. We're going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And there's going to be an impartation. There's going to be an infilling. There's going to be just a bubbling up, a welling up of the Spirit of God in your life like never, ever before. How do you know that, Greg? Because I've been praying for it and God spoke it to me. 
I want to ask today, is there anybody in this place today that you've never given your life to Jesus? You, you cannot say today that if I were to die, I would spend eternity with God. If you're here and you say, Greg, man, I, I don't know, but I want to know. I want to know that I belong to Jesus, that He is my King and my Savior. I want my sins forgiven. If that's you and you say, that, I want that in my life, I want to invite you to step out of your seat right now. Do something very bold. And I want you to come and meet me right here. I want to pray a special prayer with you that you're going to step through the door, Jesus, into the kingdom of God. And it's going to be greater than you've ever imagined. Your sins are going to be washed away. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to be cleansed. And you're going to become a brand new person today. So if you're here and you've never given your life to the Lord, and you want to do that, I want to take a moment to give you that opportunity. Would you come right now? Just step out and come. Anybody? Come on, don't think about it. I feel like in my heart there are. Come on, God's going to change your life forever. Come on, church, be praying in this particular part right here. Just be praying. God's moving on some hearts. God's moving on some hearts. Come right now in the name of Jesus. Come. Let Him do that work in your life. Let Him become your King. Let Him become your Lord. Let Him wash your sins away. Let Him give you a new life. Let Him bring you into a new day today. Step out of your seat right now and come in Jesus' name. Father, draw them by your Spirit. There's no other way for them to come unless Holy Spirit draws them. So Father, work in their life right now. Work in their heart this morning as they surrender their lives to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You're still welcome to come during this altar call and grab me and say, Greg, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus or one of these other pastors and say, that's me. You can do that. But right now, I want to pray for those. I want to ask Neil to come up and the other pastors in the church to come up with me here. And if you're here and you're saying, I need my identity fixed. I need my purpose back. I need my relationship with God put back on track. I want you to step out of your seat and come. I need a fresh infilling of your spirit, Lord. Come on in Jesus' name. Come on, pastors. Give me some pastors up here. Tom, David, your wives. Come on, David. Just begin to pray for them. Lay your hands on them. Begin to, begin to release it.